Um, you also served in Afghanistan with the British Army. Yes. Um, what made you want to join the British Army? So I, I think uh, I missed the banter when uh, when I was in uh, when I got out. So I thought it'd just be nice to join the the uh, the TA. Um, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd done a lot of things in the Australian Army, so it was nice to, to sort of come back in. and um, So it was, it was good fun, you know, coming back and you know, being horribly rude to people and vice versa, So, which is what all the banter is about, really. So, um, And then, yeah, I had a, a fantastic time serving with the Grenadier Guards uh, in the Falkland Islands and then Afghanistan, so, um, so that was yeah, good fun. What were the main differences between being in the British Army and the Australian Army? Um, the, I don't know the 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 conditions of service are def definitely different. So I think in the Australian military, you definitely got looked after better. Um, you, I mean, just if you talk about pay, you know, all your pay is tax free when you're in operations. You get massive tax free allowances. Um, so like my mates are in Afghanistan at the moment in the Australian Army are getting 150 pounds a day tax free and their salary is tax-free, whereas if you're in the British Army, you're paying tax and you're getting a couple of quid a day <laughs> as, as you're allowed. So, yeah, so there's a massive difference in that. Um, I think the, uh, the the other one which was surprising was uh, insurance, in that you have to get your own insurance policy um, if you're in the British Army, which I think was a bit, you know... I mean, th they do cover certain things, but you get, you know... Um, very much encouraged to get your own insurance policy, which I think is a bit uh, cheeky. <laughs> um, looking at your role in Afghanistan, yeah. what did you do there? So I was the second in command of a rifle company, um, and we were in a small town called Charyanjia, um, which had just sort of been, I guess, liberated, as it were, from the Taliban um, a month or two before we arrived. So uh, what we were trying to do was... Um, help build this secure community, um, help build the, uh, you know, the local infrastructure in that community and then expand the security bubble so you had a lot of people living in a, a fairly violence-free sort of existence. Were the civilians receptive to your presence? I think the majority were. So, um, and it, a lot of it came down to engagement with the local community and doing the basics. So education is very, very important. So we uh, helped facilitate a school which had 600 boys. We had a girls school. Um, we wanted to be one of the same thing, but that didn't really work. Um, we ran local elections. Um, so there was representation at a local level. Um, we helped about 5,000 farmers uh, get wheat so they could sort of transition from um, opium over to wheat. Um, and then we helped with a range of sort of employment programs and everything like that. So I think there was a tremendous amount of good we were able to do uh, in the local community. Were you met with any resistance when you were in Afghanistan? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we also had 180 contacts with the enemy, so uh, I guess. So, so there was that. Um, and then I think um, there were also a lot of concerns about the, um, the way the local security forces behaved. So that was always a challenge to sort of try and build up the credibility of that and also build up the rule of law um, in, in, in that country. How did the local security forces behave and what were the problems with the law existing then? Um, I mean, I think if you uh, have an understanding of the history of the Taliban, a lot of the reason the Taliban existed was actually because of a reaction to you know, appalling behaviour by the incumbent government sort of 25, 30 years ago and the way the police acted and everything like that so so a lot of that mistrust sort of was still there um, and I think it was all about trying to professionalize the security forces so it's not just you know the the biggest gang in town and all their mates it's actually about trying to turn it into an organization that has skills and um, is trained and you know understands that they can't do whatever they want. Do you think it brought about lasting change there? Um, I think it possibly could, but it's. I think uh, Afghanistan is a place that will take years and years to fix. So, and trying to do it in a ten-year period is a bit ambitious. Um, what was the main difference between serving in Iraq to serving in Afghanistan? Um, uh, Iraq is a far more developed country. Um, I think it has uh, a lot more going for it. Um, Afghanistan, I think, has always 
you know, for hundreds if not thousands of years really struggled um, because it's always been a sort of an intersection of multiple different empires um, and, and definitely suffered as a result of that. Uh, and it just does not have the infrastructure um, or the economy or anything in place like you have uh, in Iraq. I mean, yeah, education is a good example whereby uh, I think in about 2000 there were about a million kids in education um, which is you know five percent of the population, which is ridiculous. So, um, whereas now it's a it's a much larger number going through school, which is fantastic. But um, that may all sort of disappear in about two years' time when the coalition falls out. Were people keen to send their children to school, or was it something that took a lot of? No, absolutely. Yeah, it was. Um, I think it's one of the biggest you know concerns for parents over there. It's about how can they improves the lives of their kids and education is absolutely fundamental to that. Mm -hmm. um, so you eventually came to join the Fusiliers. Mm. When was this and why did you decide to join? Uh, so when I got back from Afghanistan I um, ended up getting promoted uh, and uh, was uh, offered command of the Fusilier Company of the, uh, of the London Regiment so, so I thought that was a pretty cool thing. How are the Fusiliers different from other regiments? with whom you've served? Uh, every regiment has, has their differences. I mean, something that's great about the Fusiliers is they have such a long history, um, you know, albeit you know, a lot of the, the regiments have amalgamated, but it's, it's awesome to be part of a... You know, as an Aussie who, you know, Australia you know, was set up in the late 18th century and you know, this regiment predates Australia by about 100 years, so it's pretty cool to be part of, of that and you know, have the headquarters here in the Tower of London, which is... a even a slightly older building still, so, yeah. What preparation did you do to join the Fusiliers? Uh, a bit of reading, uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, I had to, yeah, it'd be rude if I didn't know the history of the Fusiliers and stuff like that, so, uh, you know, it was very much about understanding, you know, the regiment and all the, the um, customs and traditions yeah. of the regiment. What does your role involve in the Fusiliers? So, um, London has always been a a, uh, a very big fusilier place. Um, you know, it was set up here, you know, 330 years ago. Um, and, you know, World War One, there were 20,000 fusiliers from London that were killed. Um, so we have a, you know, we have the legacy of, of trying to retain that tradition here in London, um, sort of as we are the only, you know, 90 soldiers left, as it were, of, of that tradition. So. Um, I think a key thing is about maintaining that and, and promoting, you know, the fusilier presence in London, um, and then that's probably, you know, also balanced by the need to provide a uh, a military capability for operations. Um, so we have a lot of guys serving in uh, Afghanistan this year, uh, a lot of guys who've served in Iraq uh, and elsewhere, and obviously we've got the Olympics on at the moment, so we've got a few lads involved in that. What is a typical day for you like with the Fusiliers? So the TA is a little bit different from the regular army in that it's not a normal nine to five mm -hmm. army job. Not that the army has ever ever been a nine to five job. Um, so the normal life of a TA unit is sort of Tuesday nights and then one week in a month and so on. Um, however, as I have to command the company, it actually sort of uh, means quite a lot of work every day so most of which I can do from home or the office thankfully but uh, um, you know there's a lot of issues around managing our soldiers making sure they get the training they need um, making sure there aren't any major welfare dramas look at who commands who and you know deal with just general management so yeah. Do you prefer your role in the Fusiliers to your previous role? Um, they're, they're different um, it's great being a company commander um, but it's sort of a shame that as a TA company commander you'll never really get to command your soldiers on operations, so, whereas in the regular army you, you can do that, so, because that's sort of the, the perfect job to have, I think. Is there anything particularly hard about being a company commander, maybe looking after so many men? Um, I, I think the difficulty in, um, in the TA is that um, you, you don't have that easy control over them like you do in the regular army so in the regular army everyone is there so and often the boys all live in the same place so you can just deal with problems here and then whereas in the TA everyone's very dispersed um, you may not see some soldiers for several weeks um, so there's a real um, there, there's a real burden around how, how we do that. 
um, as well as being a company commander, you run your own business. Yes. How do you balance your time between the two? Uh, I don't think I do. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's incredibly difficult to try to do the two. Um, I mean, fortunately, um, I have the ability to be somewhat flexible with the business because I run it. Um, but, you know, it is, you know, there's a tremendous amount of... Um, difficulty in trying to balance my army life and my, my business life so do you think that's a problem that many people in the territorial army have to deal with hugely yeah absolutely yeah. so and as the ta has to take on more and more responsibility for the defense of the realm um it, i think it'll be a real real challenge so yeah um looking back over your whole career what do you think you've learned from being in the army and have you been able to apply it to business um, I think um, makes me sound like I'm old. Uh, I, I think you know being in the military is fantastic because you really I get I guess get an understanding of what you can do and what you can't do individually. You know because you know you do get pushed a lot of times in the military and you know challenged with various things. So I think it's great about understanding where my limit is and, and what I can do um, in terms of applying that to business. You know. Uh, business can be quite uncertain um, and you know challenging at times but in some respects it's nowhere near as challenging as getting shot at or bombed or worrying about your soldiers getting killed so um, I think um, it, it's actually a really good uh, uh, preparing ground for for moving into business because you know nothing really in business life will, will come quite as close to some of the uh, life or death decisions you get in the army what do you enjoy most about being in the army? Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, you get some fantastic friends, and I think you know, sort of those very personal relationships, you know, are probably the the real awesome bit. And you know, you have great experiences with your mates, and um, so I think you know, that's the real joy that m many of us have. And I think, you know, as you're probably talking to a lot of um, people in these interviews, a lot of people see the military as their family in, in many respects. So. Um, it's sort of like still being in boarding school, sort of Peter Pan-like, so, yeah. Um, over your time, have you observed many changes? And if so, what changes have you seen? Um, I think, uh, I guess if, if I just bring this down into the British Army and the TA, I think um, the TA is becoming a more professional organisation, which creates a huge amount of tension um, in terms of how you try and do that. Um, but I think that's a really good thing, you know, that the TA or what will become the reserve should be a, you know, a professional organisation that's part-time rather than a dad's army kind of view that many people have of the TA. So I think that's, that's a massive transition that's happening at the moment. Do you often come up with, come up across people who have wrong perceptions of the TA? Um, it does happen a bit, um, but um, most people that have dealt with the TA have, uh, on ops, you know, it's just like the rest of the army. You've got some guys who are great, some guys who are utterly horrendous, and most people are generally all right. So, um, so you know, it, I think it will you know take a while for uh, the TA to potentially be as valued um, as it could be. I mean, a, a lot of us are ex-regular as well and have a tremendous amount of operational experience. So, it's very tough to sort of ignore that in, in conversations about whether the TA is a competent organisation or not. And what new roles has the TA taken on that makes you say it's becoming more professional or in which ways has it changed? So, um, I mean, a lot of our guys are doing frontline infantry work at the moment, um, which probably wasn't the case sort of 10 years ago. Um, yeah, some of our guys are in command positions in regular battalions in the regular army now on operations. Um, so, again, that, you know, starts to change the dynamic of you know, the TA going and protecting, you know, Camp Bastion or, or whatever to doing frontline roles. Um, and obviously the TA is meant to become a much bigger organisation as well. So I think, you know, there'll be a, a huge change in, in what's expected of us. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you want to add? No, no, no. Thank you very much. That is all right.